and in this lecture I'll cover the existence and uniqueness of solutions, mainly of first order uh, differential equations, and then look at the principles of linearity as they apply to homogeneous and also to non-homogeneous problems. These are tools that you will use in the rest of the chapter, and I'm putting them all of, all of them here, so in the rest, at the end of the chapter, if I refer to, for example, in the method of undetermined coefficients, if we refer to the extended principle of linearity, you can come back to this lecture and find it for review. We're going to look at existence and uniqueness theorems for first order differential equations, and in general, we write this as the derivative equals some function of t and y. The theorems are going to place conditions on this function. Right now, it doesn't have to, of course, be specified. The conditions are going to be those of continuity. For existence, you're looking for the continuity of f, and this is for existence. Okay. For uniqueness, you look at the continuity of the partial of f with respect to the solution y. The written lecture also includes a section called optional reading and it is on something called Lipschitz continuity. The textbook states only continuity but there is a weaker condition called Lipschitz continuity that is used in the theorems, uh, in the proof of the theorems for existence and uniqueness for these equations. I included it here for those who have an interest in such things and also so that you heard it before. If you take a higher order class you're going to run into this kind of continuity so it's good to just to hear it here and know that the continuity conditions that are specified in the text and in these notes are actually too strong. The next point I want to mention is that why do the functions have to be continuous um, for continuity and for existence? The reason they do is because that's they were able to construct proofs, and the proof of existence required this continuity, right? That means that the theorems that prove continuity don't disprove it, because a function, this f is not necessarily continuous, or that first derivative is not necessarily continuous, does not mean a so solution doesn't exist, and does not mean that the solution is not unique. They aren't disproving that. They require those conditions to prove existence and to prove uniqueness. But, so I just wanted to point that out. So here is the existence theorem for first order initial value problems. Remember initial value problems is one as specified right here. You have a function, you have a um, first derivative is the highest derivative in the problem and after that you will have one initial condition specified because it's first order. Okay, we're looking here at f. f can be linear, nonlinear. This not. This is the most general. Um, this is the most general theorem. So we want f to be some real value function that's continuous on a rectangle. That looks a little hard to see. So what that means is that remember we start at some initial condition, and in the previous lecture I put that initial condition to be t equals zero. I wrote y of zero equals zero, so the t zero is zero. But you could have any t zero, so let's just say here's t naught, and here is the value y naught. So around this there is some kind of a rectangle, and for this rectangle I'll go, maybe it looks, well, can, all right, should be, all right. So this edge of the rectangle is t naught minus delta, and this edge is t naught plus delta. And here's, and this edge of the rectangle is y naught plus epsilon, and y naught minus epsilon. And in this rectangle, f of t is continuous. All right. The theorem guarantees that there will be some solution on an interval about t, let me get another color here, um, okay, about so, some interval about t naught, but it might not be all the way out to the interval in t 
where the function was continuous. That's what the delta 1 is. So the, this edge is t naught minus delta 1, and this edge is t naught plus delta 1, and delta 1 is less than delta. So this is called local existence. Right about your initial point, there's going to be some solution. This could be a very small region, or it could be the entire interval where the function was continuous. To find that interval, you need to find the solution. In general, we're going to go and look at linear first order of problems, and in that case, you don't need the solution, but in general, you do need the solution. That interval where it is continuous is called the interval of validity. And there's a question on this on one of the exams, and it's similar to this question here. Okay, so what do we have here? dy by dt equals, and that's going to equal some function of t and y, and in this case, it's 1 minus y squared. So this is a nonlinear problem. If y wasn't squared, it'd be a linear problem, but y is squared, so it's a nonlinear problem. And we're given some initial condition, y of 0 equals 0. So t naught is 0, and y naught is also 0. Here's the solution. Um, well, let's look back a minute. Is this function continuous? Where is it continuous? It's continuous everywhere for all t. 1 minus y squared, 1 minus y, y. It's, it's continuous. But the solution is not defined at quite a few points. Here's the solution, the tangent of t. The tangent function is not defined at Right? So let's look at how that, if we look at a graph, we can see the interval of validity easier. So the blue curve here was one with the initial condition t naught equals 0, t naught equals 0, and y naught, of course, is equal to 0, and so we're starting right here. Now, even though that function was continuous for all time, the solution is only valid. It's kind of hard to read that on this open interval, and so that is the interval of validity. But that only applies to that particular initial condition. If we switch initial conditions and write y of pi equals 0, so that t naught is pi, here's t naught for the second case, and here is the, where the solution starts for the second case. The interval of validity is now pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. Right. So the idea is that you look at the function f, right, dy by dt equals f. You find out where that's continuous. Um, in this case, it was continuous everywhere. But in general, you have to find the solution. You look at the solution and find out where that is continuous or defined, and that will give you an interval of validity. Now you have a the um, existence of a solution from the previous equation, is it the only solution? Have you find all the solutions by finding one solution? And that's a question of uniqueness. And here's the theorem on uniqueness for general first order initial value problems. It starts off just the same as this theorem for existence. You look at the continuity of f on some rectangle. But now we're going to look at more. We want to look at the continuity of that first derivative, the first partial of f, with respect to y. OK, here I want to make a, a word of caution. All right, on notation. If you are um, in physics at all, then if you have a partial with respect to t, you write that as x dot. If you have the partial of x with respect to well, that was a poor choice of variables. Let's say z, a spatial variable, you write that as x prime. So this, that's notation you might be used to. In this class, um, I try to avoid it, but the book doesn't. Um, any abbrevi this abbreviation is not used at all, 
and only this is used. So you might have f prime could be the partial with respect to t, f prime might be the partial with respect to y. So you have to read carefully. Prime is used as an abbreviation for any derivative, not specifying whether it has to do with time or with the spatial variable. I try to write them out, but sometimes I use primes. So the idea for the uniqueness theorem is that you have to have the same conditions you had for existence. You have to have existence first, and then you add an additional condition on it, and that's at the partial of f with respect to y is also continuous on this rectangle. Then you get existence because of that you satisfied the conditions for existence. This term then gives you a, an addition uniqueness. But the uniqueness is on an even smaller interval. So this is local existence and then even more local uniqueness. So here's a picture of this that I put in the written lectures that I tried to put together. So here's your initial point, t naught y naught could be zero. T t naught could be zero. We just use general t naught. Any initial point, and then you have an interval where both f and its first derivative, first partial with respect to y, both of them are continuous in this rectangle. And here is t naught plus or minus delta and y naught plus or minus epsilon. Right? Because of the continuity of the function, you have this interval, which I kind of showed in red, where existence is guaranteed. And then because of the because of the um, continuity of the partial with respect to y, you have an even smaller region, well, theoretically smaller region, where uniqueness is guaranteed. Of course, all of these could be equal, and you could be all the way out to here, or you could be in a very, very narrow region right about t naught. Let's look through this case for a minute on how uniqueness fails. We're going to start with this differential equation. So in this case, f is um, 3 y to the 2 thirds power. y to the 2 thirds power is continuous everywhere. So it's continuous for all real numbers. So there's no problem of existence. So existence is guaranteed. So existence is OK. No problem. Now, although of course it's local. Now what's the condition for uniqueness? It's not really satisfied because if I take this first partial with respect to y, so I'm taking the partial um, of f, so I'm taking the partial with respect to y of 3 y to the 2 thirds power, OK, I get. 2y to the minus 1 third power. I'll write that in the denominator just for emphasis. Again, it's not an exponential from e that I'm writing in the denominator. Um, or you can see it up here. It's not defined because you can't divide by 0. So it's not defined at y equals 0. Look at my initial condition. t naught equals 0. y naught equals 0. Uniqueness is not satisfied at that point or in any rectangle about that point. Again, you know, it's not even defined there. So you can't get the rectangle for the continuity of df by dy. So uniqueness has failed. Now we can show two solutions that both will work for this. And um, the two solutions, they both satisfy this differential equation. And you can't select one over the other. So here are the two solutions. Both of them satisfy the differential equation. And this is a graph of them. In one case, well, actually, there's more because you could multiply this. OK, so here is one of them, and here's the other one. So if you start at this point, you do not know which path this will take. This is an example from the textbook. And this was give, the differential equation was given as the volume, the size of a raindrop. OK, so there was a little reality check there that I put in that the initial condition, y of 0 equals 0, means a raindrop starts out at 0. This would mean it could stay at 0 or it could grow. But raindrops don't start at 0. They start because there's a little piece of dust in the atmosphere that gets up to about millimeter size. And then water vapor starts attaching to that little piece of dust. And then it grows into a raindrop. So 
Raindrops don't start here anyway, so you haven't lost anything by this lack of uniqueness at this point, but it does demonstrate the lack of uniqueness. So it kind of shows you a typical proof for uniqueness, which you might see in, um, in a, another class in math. Also, you can see it in this um, in the textbook uses it. If you want to show uniqueness, you find two solutions, y1 and y2. Both of them satisfy the differential equation. Then when you work through the steps, you find that y1 is equal to y2, showing that they are the same. And that's another way to demonstrate uniqueness. Now we'll look at linear problems. Remember, for a linear differential equation, the derivatives and the function are only to the first power. Everything else can be as nonlinear as it wants to be. So here is my nonlinear differential equation, and again we're working with initial value problems. This is a first order, so I have one initial condition. Right. Existence and uniqueness are both satisfied or guaranteed for this type of a problem on the interval i where this coefficient here and the forcing function are both continuous. When they're continuous, then the solution will exist and it will be unique on that same interval. So that's a much easier condition, but we're more stringent about the type of first order problem that falls under this, um, to which this theorem applies. Okay, this is the other piece of the um, question. I think it's on the final. There was a tangent in it, and there's also something like this. So here's the idea. You have, this is a, um, a linear differential equation. dy by dt is the general way it's written. p of t is used here, and that this will be standard. And this is q of t. So. This is non-homogeneous because the q is out here. You do have some kind of forcing function. The y and the dy by dt are to the first power only, so it's linear. Linear, in this case, non-homogeneous. And these terms are any function of time. Okay, now we need to find where they're continuous. So if we look at the first one, we find that it's not defined for t plus or minus 2. For the second one, it's not defined when t is equal to minus 10. So if we pull all those numbers out of the real number line, here's a minus 10, minus 2, 2, that's it, okay. So that gives us all these intervals where they're both continuous. If my initial condition falls in here, get another color, well maybe not. So let's say the initial condition is here, t naught equals 0. Then the interval of validity is minus 2 to 2. If my initial condition is t naught is minus 12, minus 12, then the interval of validity is minus infinity to minus 10. So again, you have a local existence, but it's determined not by the solution, but just by the uh, continuity of p of t and q of t. Now if that linear equation has constant coefficients, so here's your linear equation looking like this, dy by dt in general, some function of time times y, and that equals some forcing function. If these are constants, say a and b, then well actually they're continuous everywhere because they're just constants, that means that there exists a unique solution for this differential equation that would be a linear first order differential equation with constant coefficients that exists um, for all values of t. So now we have a, uh, we don't even have to check for an interval of validity. The interval of validity is the entire real line. Before when we were talking about uniqueness, or rather lack of uniqueness, we said that if you have a certain starting point, you different solutions can emanate from that point and you wouldn't be able to select them. That's an idea of of lack of uniqueness. Now look at it a different way. What is one of the um, characteristics of uniqueness? And that is that solutions cannot intersect or cross. 
because if they did, then you would have several solutions coming out of a single point. Here's an example for a first order equation. Let's say this is your um, one solution, called the equilibrium solution right here. Oops. So this is one solution. It happens to be a solution to your differential equation. There's too many parentheses in there. Okay. I'm going to get rid of one of them. Okay. If you have another solution that starts up here, it might come down towards it, but it can only approach asymptotically. So this approach here is asymptotic, meaning it never reaches it, and it never merges with it, and it never crosses it. Solution that starts below it will come up towards it, but it will never, it, it will again approach it asymptotically. It will not reach it, um, it will not merge with it, it will not cross it. Let's look at something from a higher order equation just to emphasize this point. Let's say you have a periodic solution. So here's a solution. Um, and the idea of being periodic is if it starts on this solution, it's just going to keep going round and round on it. But any solution that started inside of it can't come outside because it cannot it can approach this, but it can't cross over. And any solution that starts outside cannot get into it. So this is a quality of uniqueness. Now we're going to look at linearity. There are going to be three principles of linearity. One of them, this principle of superposition or just linearity in general, applies to the homogeneous differential equations. Those are the ones where you can write equals zero on one side. Then the other two apply to, um, well that was a poor choice of color. Okay, the other two are called extended linearity principles and they apply to the non-homogeneous case in which you're equal to some forcing function q of t or h of t, whatever. There's some function that doesn't involve y, is not multiplying y or its derivatives and it's on, you can organize it so that it's on one side of the equal sign, then you'll have two different linearity principles and they're called extended linearity principles. I'm writing this for a second order equation because I want to show uh, the principle a little bit better than for a first order equation. So if you have a second order equation and two solutions, I'll call them y1 and y2, are solutions of this second order equation, then you can make a linear combination of them. Linear means to add them together and multiply them by constants. That's linearity. Just do it all in one in one step. Sometimes it's sh uh, to show it you would add them together and then you would multiply them by constants. Just do it all at once. C1, any constant times the first one plus any constant times the second one. You add them together and that will also become a solution for the same equation. And this just follows directly from linearity of the differential operator. If I took the derivative of C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2, well, that's not what I get at all, is it? There are errors in the notes. I, um, I did, I'm sorry, if you find them, you can send them to me, please. Okay, so this will be C1 times the derivative of Y1, C2 times the derivative of Y2. It's just a linear operator. So when you put that into a differential equation, linearity falls out as well. Okay, so let me show that a little bit here. Um, Let's look at this one. So we're going to take a second derivative. If I take a second derivative, I get C1, okay, times the second derivative of Y1, plus C2 times the second derivative of Y2. Now I'm going to put that in this, in this equation. So I have C1, I'll use primes, y1 plus c2 plus the constant p times c1 y1 plus c2 y2 equals zero. Well you can rearrange it so you have c1 times y double prime 1 plus p times y1 
plus C2 times the second, same thing for that second solution. This is zero, this is zero, the sum is zero. That's why it works. But it only works, as you can see, because they have to add to zero, it only works for the homogeneous case. You can see from that first, um, the previous idea, if it was a non-homogeneous problem and it equaled some function q of t, okay, so you had that second derivative, then if both solutions satisfied the differential equation and you put in there C1, Q1, C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2, the result would be C1 times Q plus C2 times Q. It would not be Q itself. So you see it wouldn't hold for non-homogeneous equations. However, there's these extended linearity principles and this first one is extremely important and used frequently. Okay, so we're going to look at, let's look at a first order equation. All right, and it's non-homogeneous because of the Q of t, it's first order because you only have the first derivative. It's linear because the first derivative and y of t are to the first power only. All right, now we're going to define two solutions. One's going to be called the particular solution and it is um, symbolized with a little subscript p on the y. And that is the solution to the equation with Q of t in place. Now we look at another solution and we're going to call that the complementary solution and we'll put a little subscript C on that one. And that's the solution of the same equation but the Q of t here is replaced with a zero. So you make a homogeneous equation out of a non-homogeneous equation and you solve it. And then you get the complementary solution y of c. So you have two solutions, y of p and y of c. Particular is when q of t is in place, the complementary is when it's not, when it's zero, set to zero. And here is the extended, first extended linearity principle. Then you can take a linear combination of the complementary solution and you can add it to the particular solution and you get this. And this will be your solution to the differential equation. So you would have C times the complementary plus add the particular. You don't want to multiply a particular by C because then you would multiply Q of T by C in your solution and that would not be correct. If you had a second order of equation, it would look like this. C1, first complementary solution. I'm not putting the um, T dependence just to save space. So you make a linear combination here. This will work. So you make a linear combination of the complementary solutions and then you add in the particular solution and that solves your differential equation. You can then evaluate C1 and C2 or C in terms of the initial condition. So this is the first extended linearity principle. So when you go to solve a non-homogeneous equation, first you set the Q of t equal to zero and you find the complementary solution. Then you go back and figure out a way to find the particular solution. And there's a method for doing it. It's called method of undetermined coefficients. Is one. There's also another one called variation of parameters. So then you find this y of p. You have your yc's. You put this combination together, looking something like this, or maybe like this if it's first order. And then you have a solution to your non-homogeneous equation. The second extended linearity principle applies again to non-homogeneous equations and it's a w way of finding solutions when that forcing function is more complicated. So your Q of t consists of two terms like maybe Q of t equals sine omega t plus t to the fourth. So your Q1 is the sine omega t, your Q2 is t to the fourth. What you can do is find a solution, y1, that just applies to the sine omega t, you find a second solution, y2, that just applies to the y to the fourth, and you can add them together. So it's sort of practical. It's pretty hard to find something uh, that complicated in one step. This is just a quick example of going over the two extended linearity principles. 
So we have a differential equation here. We can see that it's here is the form for a linear equation that is non-homogeneous. Okay, the p of t in this case is minus 3. The q of t has two, two pieces. So the first thing we do is we set all of q of t equal to 0 and we find the complementary solution. dy by dt equals minus 3y. Uh, the solution is, the complementary solution is e to the 3t. Okay, we're done. Now we have that piece. Now we have to go and find the particular solutions. First we set the equation to this and we find the first particular solution. It happens to be that. You can substitute it in and show that that's a solution, but that's not the point here. Now, we're done with that. We set the equation equal to negative 4, oops, I'm sorry, negative 4 e to the 4t. Whoa, it's not negative 4 e to the 4t, is it? It's just negative e to the 4t. Okay, got it. I think this time. Okay, and we find a second particular solution. Then we're going to say the total particular solution is the sum of those two. Here they are. And I can add to it some, because there's only one, a linear combination would just be C, times the complementary solution. So here is the total solution now. So here was the complementary, whoops, here was the complementary solution. All right, it's multiplied by C. Wait a minute. That was supposed to be minus 3, wasn't it? Okay, sorry about that. So you multiply that by, um, this is your complementary solution here. You can multiply that by a constant because it's going to be 0 anyway when you put it in the differential equation. Now the particular solution had this piece and it also had this piece and they're all added together.